So this film, uh, basically, I mean, I'll have to take it back to the real life Najib. It all started from the life that a man actually lived. This film is based on a real story. And not only is it based on a real story, the person who lived the life that you will see in this film is still very much alive and well amongst us, Mr. Najib Mohammed. Author Benjamin, who discovered or came to know of such a person, immediately wanted to write his life, document his life and make a book out of it. And then Benjamin wrote a book called Aad Jeevitam based on Najib's life and that book was published in 2008. And it was an immediate success, smash hit. To date remains one of the largest selling books in the history of Malayalam. And as soon as the book was released, I'm, I know for a fact that multiple filmmakers, uh, actors, all of us had the thought running that, oh wow, this would make an epic film. But uh, as destiny would have it, the person who got the rights to the book uh, is director Blessy. And uh, as luck for me would have it, uh, Blessy thought I, I am the actor who should be playing Najib. So that's how uh, the idea behind the film came into uh, came into existence. It's, a, it's quite a long story because uh, Blessy and me shook hands and decided that we are going to do the film in early 2009. So yeah, it's been quite a long journey. So yes, from uh, 2008 where Blessy managed to get the rights to the book to 2024 as we speak few days prior to the release, it's been a 16 year long journey. Even back in 2008, 2009 when Blessy first spoke to me about his vision for the idea of uh, Aadi Jeevitam as a film, it was very big and grand. He always wanted to make this film in this huge canvas, go to real locations and shoot and make it look as organic as possible. So back in 2009, the kind of money, the kind of budget uh, that would be required uh, to pull off something like this was unthinkable, at least from Malayalam. You have to uh, remember that, you know, I'm talking about a period in time where Pan-India did not exist. <laughs> so. You know, the whole terminology called Pan-Indian Cinema had not yet been uh, invented. So it was quite a challenge uh, for Blessy and me to be able to put a business model in place where we could think of doing a film. It took 10 years. A lot of things changed, fortunately, in those 10 years. Uh, cinema changed in general. Malayalam cinema in particular went through a transformation in terms of uh, how we monetize our revenue streams, etc. And uh, finally in 2008, sorry, 2018, uh, even though it still remained as it does today, a very, very big financial risk, we were able to start shoot. Uh, so 2018, we started shooting. We first shot the portions for which I put on a lot of weight. So the idea was since the character required a physical transformation that I would first put on a lot of weight and then lose the weight so that the change would seem all the more drastic. So I put on a lot of weight and we shot all those portions. Uh, first in Kerala, then we went to Jordan and shot the desert portions where I was required to look fat. And then we stopped shoot and uh, the idea was that I will be given about seven to eight months to lose as much weight as I can. And I ended up losing way more than I anticipated. I ended up losing 31 kilos and I looked like a different person, which you will see in the film. And we went back to Jordan early 2020 and we started shoot on the slim portions in the desert. But unfortunately, few days into the shoot, uh, COVID-19 struck the world and the shoot had to be stopped and everything came to a standstill. We were stuck, the whole crew uh, was stuck in Jordan in the middle of a desert for almost three months uh, till we managed to get a repatriation flight and came back to India. At that point in time, Blessy and me, uh, we had no idea what was ahead. We didn't know what was on the other side of the pandemic. We didn't know if we could ever be if we would ever manage to regroup and finish the film. And it was quite heartbreaking because by then we had already invested so much of time, effort, money, everything into the film. But thankfully, although the gap, the suspension in shoot was almost one and a half years, we managed to regroup, go back to Algeria, shoot the uh, escape portions of the film. Then we came back to Jordan. We shot what we could not shoot in 2020. Then finally we came back to Kerala we did a patchwork of a couple of scenes that had to be shot inside a set. And the film finished its shoot uh, in 2022. And then there was this extensive post-production schedule because uh, we were very, very keen on making sure that this would always remain a zero compromise film. So every uh, facet of the post-production process, from sound to music, to VFX, to uh, color grading, everything took a lot longer than it usually does for a film. 
but the time and the skill and the effort and the money, uh, I believe, can be seen on the screen. Anyway, finally, as we are sitting here, 16 years later, 2024, 28th of March, the film is hitting the screens, cinemas across the world. I couldn't be happier. Looking forward to it. So when Blessy and me set out to make this film, obviously there were, there were a lot of uh, suggestions, a lot of opinions on how this could be done in the most efficient manner. And uh, you have to realize that when you're talking of a 16 year, 16 year long journey behind one film, even the technology associated with filmmaking has undergone uh, quite a few changes in that time period. So as we started shoot in 2018, we did have the option of thinking of this as a, as a studio film, you know. Uh, there were a few people who thought that we should actually put up the set of the Masera in the desert where the animals are held inside a studio floor and shoot it against green mat. And that would be the easier, faster, cheaper, more efficient way to make this film. But one thing Blessy always uh, had in mind was that he wanted to shoot this film in the most organic way possible, to go to the real locations, to make sure that the elements and the actors and the animals all interact with each other. Uh, and he wanted the film to be as real as possible. And that entailed a lot of effort, uh, effort and money. And, and also shooting in a topography like a desert includes, uh, involves rather taking into account multiple factors that are beyond our control like light, weather, climate. Blessy even went to the extent, Blessy and Sunil, our cinematographer, even went to the extent of charting each scene and deciding, okay, this scene has to happen within the story at this particular time of the day. So then there were multiple scenes, like say for example, a sunrise scene. The actual sunrise light in, in the desert would only last, last for about 15 to 20 minutes as the sun is slowly peeping through the, uh, from the horizon. When the sun comes up a bit, then it becomes very bright in the desert. So you would get about 20 minutes, 25 minutes of this actual early morning light, like just before sunrise. And uh, there, are, there are scenes that need to happen in that light in the film. And this would be like one scene shot across 25 sunrises, you know, through 25 days. Same thing for a, for a scene that we thought should happen when the sun is dead on top with absolute top light beating, on, beating down on the actors. So we got that right. We made sure that the scenes that needed to be shot in a particular time of the day was only shot like that. There's a sandstorm sequence uh, in, in the film. In Vadiram, where we shot, we get these sandstorm alerts uh, that at this particular date, that the, the, you are in, you know, there's a warning for a sandstorm. And usually if there's a sandstorm alert, you do not go out. You don't shoot that day. But uh, you know, <laughs> uh, the filmmaker that Blessy is, uh, when we got these entire dates of potential sandstorm alerts in Vadiram, Blessy started thinking in terms of how can we shoot in the real sandstorm. Nobody's, I don't know if anybody's done that. But the technical crew in terms of the camera operators and all, they said, so it's impossible, the cameras and everything are going to get spoiled. But then Blessy said, no, I really want to capture the actual sandstorm and if there's something that happens to the cameras, I'll, I'll guarantee that I buy you a new camera and all that. And we, we shot inside a real sandstorm. So the sandstorm sequence you see in the film, of course, there is VFX involved, there is CGI involved and not all the shots, but there are a lot of shots in that sequence that uh, we shot inside uh, an actual sandstorm. The primary thanks for that uh, has to go to this one man called Blessy, our director. Because like you rightly said, all the others involved in the project, myself included, we have all done other films in between this journey, you know. But uh, director Blessy for the last 16 years has been singularly focused on this one film. And I think it's his conviction, his laser-like focus you know, his belief in what he's creating that led us, that led the team, that made sure that we were all traveling coherently in the same direction. And uh, it's a privilege to have worked with such a visionary leader, uh, such a world-class filmmaker, who set aside such a big time, such a big phase of his life to create that one big masterpiece he wanted to. So that's truly inspiring for me. I think Goat Life is mostly about the resilience of the human spirit. And like most survival stories, the common foundation that all these survival stories will always share is the resilience of the human spirit. It's just, just one man fighting against all odds, all the adverse circumstances to make it out of there. And the fact that it is a true story makes it all the more incredible. More than anything, I think what you will connect with when you watch The Goat Life is that one, uh, 
glorious celebration of the human spirit and the strength of the human mind. I think you'll walk out of the theatres inspired. We are going through a time and age when I think the human mind and our resilience is becoming progressively fragile due to various reasons, due to the age and time that we are living in, due to the fact that our world sometimes exists in, in something that is not real, like the digital domain. You know, you hear so many stories of people taking their own lives, say for instance, for reasons you think are not strong enough. You know, you, you read these articles of um, somebody, you know, breaking up with a lover and then, you know, committing suicide. To put it in perspective, when you look at someone's life like Najib's, all the adversities that he had to go through, and the circumstances that he had to fight against, the challenges that were posed in front of him, uh, when an actual living man can take on so many odds and fight through it and survive them and reach the other end of it and then be able to tell his tale to the world, I think is a truly inspirational uh, figure. Uh, more than anything, I think when you walk out of the theatres, uh, I think, I hope and I pray that you feel inspired in life. So this is not a film that has very many characters, but of course the few characters that are in the film all hold pivotal roles within the plot. There is of course Najib, the protagonist that I am playing. Uh, there is Hakim, played by this new actor called Gokul. That's a very, very important role in the film. A character called Ibrahim Khadri, uh, extremely pivotal, played by Jimmy Jean Lewis, uh, again a wonderful actor in the film. Then within the film, you don't really name their characters because they are only addressed as Arbabs, which I think literally translates to owner. Uh, so there are two Arbabs in the film. The main Arbab being played by Talib, uh, again a great actor from Oman. And the other Arbab being played by uh, Rick, uh, another wonderful actor from the UAE. Then of course there is Sainu, Najib's wife, his, his biggest motivation to fight, his biggest motivation to live through uh, those tough days. And Sainu is played by Amla Paul. Uh, then there are a lot of other characters, uh, all of them hold a very small but significant place, uh, mostly in the flashback of Najib's existence, of, of that part of the story where Blessy tells you uh, who was Najib before he landed up in the desert. What did he leave behind on, in those points?